All right, we are. Sorry. Thank you. For, thank you, Greg. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for joining us uh, for the Amherst Municipal Affordable Housing Trust meeting on um, January 11th. Uh, it is 7.01. Uh, we will wait a few minutes to ensure we have quorum. Uh, we're just waiting on one or two other trust members. Rover so, is in the audience. There are okay, Rover. So that should Rover. make it. Great. Thank you, Allegra. Trying to. I expect that Greg is trying to bring her in. Well, Rob's here too. Okay, there Rob's here Rob. as well. And as soon as Grover joins us, we will go ahead and begin. Um, Grover, you might have a pop up on your screen that you're going to want to accept to be promoted. I wonder if Grover might be transporting youngsters perhaps too. So. Okay. All right. Well, we do have we do have quorum, uh, and if Grover is in the audience and can hear us, um, and once we can move Grover over, um, then Grover can participate. But we do have quorum, so we'll go ahead and begin. It is seven oh two. Thank you again for joining us at the Amherst Municipal Affordable Housing Trust meeting today. Um, so I'm going to start with our December uh, minutes. I'm going to open up to see if there are any additions, corrections that need to be made. And if I don't hear any, I'll go ahead and accept them. Okay, not hearing any or seeing any hands up. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and accept the December minutes. Um, in thank you, Carol. In December, um, we noted that there was a correction to the November mid minutes. We uh, corrected the minutes and we did redistributed them. They were already voted upon with the corrections, so we don't need to have a vote. So I'm going to go ahead and move on to trust updates. So the first update we have is that we actually have a new trust member. Um, so we've been filling the positions. We Our trust board is of nine members, and we're up to eight right now um, with Gaston uh, being our prior new member. Now we have even an, uh, a newer member. Uh, Corinne Olson uh, will be our newest member. And um, sh uh, she unfortunately was not able to make it this evening. She will be with us in the in-person meeting on January 30th. Um, her daughter um, wasn't feeling well, so she was unable to be with us today. She will be listening to the recording. Um, I did ask her for a quick uh, intro, uh, and so I'm going to read her intro. Um, so please don't um, confuse that I am um, Corinne. I'm just reading it as the way she wrote it. Uh, <clears throat> I've been, in Amherst, I've been an Amherst resident since 2021. I have a husband and a two-year-old next week in a loving and loyal dog, Nevada. My husband went to UMass, so our connection to the area runs back many years. I graduated from Columbia University with my master's in social work in 2013, although since then I have not had any direct housing experience, many volunteer and career opportunities have given me experience and ignited a serious passion for the sector. After working as director of volunteers at a domestic violence shelter, helping run a homeless shelter for families, and taking a housing course taught by the director of Safe Passage in New York City, I've gained a deep and somber understanding of how, the necessary, how necessary housing is for everyone. Stable mental health, career, uh, a functional family life, even proper hygiene just aren't as possible if you don't have the comfort, consistency, and safety of a roof over your head. I'm very excited to join this board and support in, uh, continuing to guarantee this right to more citizens of our town. It's tragic to me that anyone be home houseless, and although I know this is a problem that may sadly never be completely eliminated, I hope we can work to expand it as much as possible and to create a more solid network of supports for folks to help them stay sustainably housed by underlying the importance of ongoing wraparound services for residents. Thank you. Very excited. So welcome, Corinne. Um, and as I said before, um, she will be um, uh, watching our recording of this evening. Um, the next item is that we actually have a vacancy. So Ashley Jensen has resigned as of the last meeting, and I want to thank her for her service and her commitment both to increasing affordable housing and the um, the advocacy that she's shown and the commitment she's shown uh, by being a trust member, and especially for her commitment to ensuring that um, people who are unhoused uh, do get housing. Um, we are working hard to fill our last vacancy, and we hope that we could possibly fill it by uh, before our next in-person meeting on January 30th. Um, then the next item is the CPA funding. 
uh, very good news. We have received $300,000 from the CPA and we want to thank the CPA for um, their support. Um, it, uh, if you have been to any of the meetings around um, the CPA having tried to make uh, funding decisions regarding um, all the applications, uh, it was very clear to me how committed they are to supporting affordable housing. At the same time, there was a lot of competition for extremely critical projects. So even though we got 2,000 less, we are very, very happy that we got the 300,000. So at this Just point, a, oh, a, hey, a Carol. quick note that we got it provided town council approved yes. it. It hasn't been approved, Thank but you. they probably will. Thank you, Carol. It's the CPA recommending to the town council. The town council has to make the final decision. So thank you, Carol, for the clarification. All right. Now I'm going to go ahead and pass on the floor to Shelly. Um, but before Shelly goes on, I really want to thank her in advance on behalf of the trust uh, for working with us tonight, uh, providing a uh, housing trust 101, and then um, continue to work with us on developing our action plan. So thank you. Absolutely. So um, can you see the slides correctly? Not yet. Okay. Not yet. It says we're viewing your screen. There we go. Oh, oh there we go. Yes. Sometimes there, sometimes there's a delay. Okay. So uh, my name is Shelly Gearing and I am with uh, Mass Housing Partnership. And tonight I'm just going to do a little bit of a affordable housing trust fund 101 kind of overview. Um, before I get started, I just want to say that I am I'm more than happy to be interrupted if something's not clear, if I'm speaking too quickly, if I'm using acronyms, if there's something, some kind of clarifying, something that you need clarifying. At each section, I will pause and ask for questions. Um, and then I suppose Erica maybe can help facilitate that if there are questions, but we don't have to wait until the end if there's something pressing or something that's not clear. So please don't, um, I, I don't mind being interrupted. So I'm gonna start with that. And um, for those of you who maybe are not quite as familiar, okay, oops, who may not be quite as familiar with MHP, we are a quasi-state agency in Massachusetts focused on increasing the supply of affordable housing across the state. And we have four main kind of outward facing teams at MHP. The first is our Center for Housing Data, which is a small group of people that are collecting, analyzing and sharing data to um, help inform effective housing policy on the local, regional and state level. They are also the team that puts together some really incredible online resources as well. We have the community assistance team that I'm part of and we're really about helping to build the local capacity to support affordable housing. We also offer technical assistance with 40B developments um, and working directly with housing authorities on surplus um, public land. We have a lending team. We've lent over $1.4 billion to create and preserve uh, over 27,000 units of affordable rental housing at this point. And we have a home ownership team. So the one mortgage product comes out of uh, our, our home ownership team, um, but we're really supporting access to home ownership for low and moderate income households in the state. So today, there are a few things that I'm wanting to cover. One, just some housing trust basics. And so for some of you, you may be more familiar than others, but I just want a kind of a baseline of what an affordable housing trust is all about. And then I'm gonna get a little bit into trust operations and best practices, just based on working in dozens of communities across the state, some things that we've learned. So it's just some suggestions. And then I'll get into eligible activities, the kinds of things that your trust can be funding and engaged in. And then I'm, I'm gonna do a little bit about working across boards. Um, I do this in some communities, particularly when you do have a community preservation committee. And I know in Amherst, you have a variety of boards that are working on housing. So I'm just gonna give a few just kind of tips and suggestions for um, working with other boards. Again, if you need to interrupt me, if I'm not clear, if I'm using acronyms, um, please, Please don't, don't wait until the end. So first, some housing trust basics. The Municipal Affordable Housing Trust Fund statute is it's organized under Mass General Law, Chapter 44, Section 55C. So that's your trust is organized under Chapter 44, Section 55C. You are a public entity. You're created by, it was created by your local legislative body with a majority vote. So at the time that was town meeting. The, the, the purpose actually is quite narrow. It's really to create and preserve affordable housing for low and moderate income households. 
some communities want everything housing to fit under the trust. And that that's not really how the statute is written. Um, it's led by a local board of trustees that's that's elected locally, that's appointed locally, excuse me. And because you are a municipal entity, like all your other public boards, you're subject to public procurement, designer selection, conflict of interest, and public meeting laws, just like all of your other municipal boards. Very generally, a housing trust fund can address affordable housing needs locally, support local control of housing initiatives. Your trust can engage in real estate activity. You could sell, buy and sell property if that made sense for you. You can make timely decisions because you don't have to go back to town council unless something's written into your bylaw, but typically you're more flexible than, for example, the community preservation committee, which um, Carol just brought up that they make recommendations, but then it still has to go to town council. That That's not how a, a trust is set up unless your bylaw requires it, but I don't know, uh, most do not require that. And you can be collecting funds from a variety of sources. And I have been told by um, a municipal attorney that donations to a municipal board are have tax advantages, just like with a nonprofit. Shelby, are you maybe one slide behind? You seem like you're one slide behind what you're talking about. I'm not positive. Right now it says, what can a housing trust fund do? Oh, no, Is that I'm what we're supposed that. to be saying? Yep, I'm still on that. Yep. All yes. right. Okay. Yes. Sorry. So you, you can be collecting money from a variety of sources. And we're seeing communities be a bit more, more and more creative around how they fund their housing trusts, which we'll get into a little bit more detail later. So the statute is a very short, simple statute, and it it, it um, offers, um, it's kind of minimalist. It, you need at least five members on your trust. You need to include the chief executive officer. So in a, um, in a town with a select board, that'd be one select board member. In the city, that's the mayor. In, um, honestly, I don't know who that is with the town council. Um, who is that? With we the have our council? town manager who's de facto. Town manager is considered CEO, okay. Um, these members are appointed by the mayor, the city council in some, some cities, the city council has some oversight select board. So it, it differs depending on the structure of your community. The statute says two year terms and many communities will stagger these just like with nonprofits so that you never have hundred percent turnover at the same year. And then the trustees, your public agents, special municipal employees, just like with your other municipal boards. The statute outlines 16 different explicit powers. And the big ones are accepting, receiving real property, purchasing, retaining real or personal property, selling, leasing. There's one that's borrowing. So there are 16 different powers that are allowed. A community can uh, modify these powers or um, create caveat, like borrowing is a concern in some communities. They might require two thirds vote of the board members, the trustees or they might require that uh, trust couldn't borrow more than a certain percentage of the assets that they that they hold. A, a town can also um, add to these powers. So while the, the state statute has these 16 powers, of course, you always wanna make sure that you're paying attention to your local bylaw or ordinance to see if there are any modifications. So you're not just going by the state statute. And then several years ago, there were some changes made to the Municipal Affordable Housing Trust Fund statute for two key reasons. One is that there were CPCs transferring money to the trust and the trusts in many cases were not reporting back to the CPC how they were spending the CPA funds. And so then the CPC was not able to report to the state how the housing funds were being spent. And so our data on the state level is, um, flawed because there isn't this circling back to report how housing CPA funds are being were being spent. And that's important because when we're advocating on the state level for more CPA funds, we want to be able to adequately explain how CPA housing funds are being spent, how many units are being supported. So one change to the trust statute is requiring that trust report back to your CPC, your community preservation committee on an annual basis how you're spending CPA funds, if you have them and if you are spending them. So the, the so then the CPC can report in their annual CP3 report to the Department of Revenue um, how the trust CPA funds are being spent. 
So the screenshot is a document, a, a fillable Word document that I created with Stuart Saganor of the, the State Community Preservation Coalition. And this helps the trust uh, report back to the CPC. It's using the exact language from the CP3 report. We also have a document that's directions of how to fill this form out, which might sound silly, but you'd be surprised at how, actually how it's not so easy to fill these forms out. So um, just a reminder that when you do have CPA funds and you're spending them, you want to make sure that you're reporting back on an annual basis. And the CP3 is due, I believe, September 15th. So you want to just facilitate, you just want to make sure that you're getting that information to your CPC in time for them to report back. I'm sorry, the other thing that was changed is that the trust statute, uh, the purpose, as I had said before, is to create and preserve affordable housing for low and moderate income households. In the CPC, there's the verb support that's specific for housing, and it didn't explicitly say in the trust statute that support activities are part of the purpose. And so there were communities that were transferring the funds and the trust wanted to do support type activities, um, but, but um, town councils didn't feel like, some town councils didn't feel like it was appropriate. So now the trust statute allows everything that's allowable under community housing with CPA um, allowable for a trust as well. So that means anything that falls under support, a trust can engage in as well. To just- uh, tip. Kelly, yeah. mm -hmm. Does that include emergency rental assistance or rapid rehousing? Yep, yep. So everything that's allowed under the CPA, community housing for CPA is now allowed for a trust. So because so many communities create a trust because they have CPA, it just made sense to make sure that those statutes were more aligned. So just two clarifications or tips. Um, when you distribute funds, just like we tell every CPC, when you're, you're using public resources, when you distribute funds, you should have a grant agreement. You should make sure that you're clear about what the funds that you're, that you're allocating are for, the um, parameters around when you expect them to be spent and you want some sort of language about in what circumstances the funds would come back to the trust if they're not used um, as you would as you would intended them to be used. The same that we would expect from a CPC. We also suggest strongly that CPCs have a grant agreement with trust when they're transferring funds so that there's clarity between both of your boards. And then to just throw out that, um, CPA area median income differs from HUD numbers. So the Department of Revenue oversees median income for CPA. They do use HUDs 100%, but then when they do 80%, they just do a straight 80%. That's not how HUD does 80%. HUD takes into account household size. And so if you want the units that you're funding with trust resources to count on the subsidized housing inventory, you just wanna make sure that you're using HUD numbers for 80% and not CPA numbers. So I'm gonna switch gears. Are there any other questions at this point from that beginning material? Nope. So trust operations and best practices. So as I said, we are we are seeing communities be more and more creative about how they're funding their trusts. So there are a variety of resources that communities are using. Certainly CPA is the most common funding source, um, although it's not a given in every community, but about 76% of our trust communities also have CPA. Uh, other ways that communities are funding their trusts is that some communities have inclusionary zoning and they may have an in lieu of payment option that a developer could pay cash instead of providing a unit. And in some cases, these funds are, it's actually in the bylaw or the ordinance that these funds would go to the trust. In other cases, they're just allocated to the trust. We have some communities that transfer free cash or funds from the general fund to their housing trust. So Truro, Brookline are communities that have done this. Um, we have one community in the Cape, they have a cell phone tower and the income from the lease payments are directed to the trust. It's not a lot of money, but it's a guaranteed small chunk every year. We have um, one community that has, has um, uh, so they have voted to allow a million dollar bond to support their trust and they don't have CPA. So it wasn't against CPA. It's against their general fund, but Medfield allowed this. I don't think that they've drawn on it, but they do have that as a, as an option. 
Orleans on the Cape has passed a tax override, a $275,000 tax override that they see as a as an annual override. So they're the only trust that I know of that has, has been able to get a line of credit from a bank because of the, this source of funding that they have. We have communities that are seeking donations for their, their um, trusts, and this can be in land or cash. There may be developer negotiated fees that can be directed to the trust. Of course, you need to be careful and cautious about how you try to negotiate developer fees. Um, but we do have one community where it was a what was refer, what's sometimes referred to as a friendly 40B development. A local developer was doing a home ownership development. And for every uh, market rate unit that he sold, he donated $10,000 to the community and then the select board directed it to their housing trust. Um, there may be special bylaws or ordinance payments. There are some communities that are using short-term rental fees. So Gloucester is an example of this and some of the Cape communities are working on this. There are communities that have talked about income from the marijuana tax. I don't yet know if any are directing it to their trust. Um, tax title sales are an option or a community like Chelsea has actually transferred tax title properties to their trust to dispose of for affordable housing. There was a Supreme Court decision that was made earlier this year that complicates this a bit that I'm not going to get into tonight, but that that is uh, that has um, gotten a bit more complicated this last year. Um, and so I think I went through all of them. So there are a variety of different whites. Oh, and then the real estate transfer fee. You're likely, you likely are familiar with the legislation of there's statewide legislation that would as an enabling legislation. And then there are individual communities like Nantucket that are trying to get a real estate transfer fee law passed, bill passed. I'm I'm not sure I know what a tax title sale is. So for properties where they are behind on taxes to the community, the municipality and the municipality takes up takes those from um, for um, because they're not paying taxes on them, like property tax, or it could be water sewer, it could be other taxes that, that are owed. And so there are times that communities may take those parcels. Thank you. Mm-hmm. So uh, when trusts are starting out or when you're um, kind of regrouping, we always suggest that you start by determining housing needs in the community, that you start with current data about um, what's going on in the community around housing needs. So I think that you're, I think that you are planning, I think Nate had said at a past meeting that you're, you're working towards um, updating a housing production plan. So I think that that's in the works and we would highly suggest that you move forward on that because it looks like that the data that you do have is perhaps a little bit dated, but we would always suggest that when you're looking to um, kind of regroup to create new goals and priorities that you really start with current data around what's going on in the community where need is. People have opinions about it. We have stories and those are all important, but we really want to make sure that we have a, a clear picture across the community. And then that you use that to then set priorities for the things that you're going to want to focus on as a trust. And you could create benchmarks if you wanted. If there's a particular need you wanted to address, you don't have to do this. But the Somerville Trust, it's actually written into their ordinance that a certain percentage of their funds has to go towards households earning, I think it's under 50, below 50% 50 of the area median income. So they just have that to make sure that not only is it a reminder to the trustees that they need to be funding the lowest income households, supporting the lowest income households in the community, but it also helps to tell anyone who would seek the funds that that's a priority for their trust. So you don't have to create benchmarks like that, but if there's a particular need you want to address, you could. We would suggest there that there are not only with your housing production plan in your process, but there are other resources out there as well to get some information about your community. So Datatown is one that MHP has developed and is updating regularly as data is updated through the census. Um, it gives you a picture of what's going on in your community and it can just help with the conversation. You're also able to make these graphs that I have here on this slide and you can just use that. It's not a cost and you can put that in your presentations or your reports just to help um, facilitate easy access to data about your community. There's also a tool that you can compare Amherst to other communities if that feels helpful with your local conversations. As trustees of your uh, trust board, 
because you're looking to support affordable housing development as one of the things that you're doing, um, it can be helpful to understand the process of financing affordable housing, what it takes to put together a deal. This is not to become experts. I'm not suggesting that you try to become experts. It's extremely complicated. But one thing that you might want to consider is to learn a little bit more about how affordable housing is financed on the housing toolbox, that there are multiple trainings that we've had where um, we talk through financing affordable housing and the different funding sources, state and federal funding sources. We also have a couple trainings where it's the developer perspective and nonprofit developers walking through what it takes for them to put together a deal and how communities can help support that process. Um, one thing that you could also do is if you felt like that that there is some learning that you that would be helpful for you is you could invite a developer, either a, an affordable housing developer, and sometimes sometimes it, you might prefer a nonprofit, but I know a trust that invited a for-profit developer to come and talk through a real development pro forma and walk through the process of putting together a, a real deal that they had worked on. This can just help you feel a little bit more familiar with what it takes um, and ways that you can help support the process as well. So it's just a suggestion that might be helpful. And we would suggest, we always suggest that you have a mission statement, so yours does. And as mission statements go, it's important to revisit them occasionally to make sure that it still fits with how you see your role in the community and how you wanna talk about your role in the community. Um, you know, we don't need to spend that much time on it tonight, but you know, you keep them short, you, you already have one to start with, but you just might wanna revisit that because it may have been several years since you've done that. And then just a, a planning framework that I've been using in communities is encouraging trusts to have, to identify two or three goals that are well-defined and measurable goals. Oftentimes in our housing plans, the goals are very general. It's things like increase the supply of senior housing. It's so, so general, and it can be really hard to figure out how to move forward from something so general. So we're really encouraging trust to narrow in on two or three goals. So this is something that I'm gonna be working with you um, on this, this for the next several months. And then from those two or three goals, then to come up with strategies, a variety of strategies that will help you meet those goals. And then once you get to that point, you can get even more specific with tasks that you can then delegate to those different members of the, of the trust to help move forward with implementation. This is an example of one small trust or a, a trust from a small community, Wellfleet on the Cape. So they had decide, they've decided working with their housing authority as well as their affordable housing partnership that the trust is going to focus on housing development. Their housing authority actually doesn't have any units, but they've historically managed some housing programs. And so they've decided that their housing authority is going to continue with programs and their partnership, it might be a committee, is going to focus on advocacy and education and some policy. So they've talked with each other. They've decided that that's how they're going to allocate their um, their focus. So the trust is focused on development. So they have two goals. One, as a measurable goal, create 100 units of low moderate income rental and homeownership housing over the next five years. And then two, raise a million dollars annually. So for Wellfleet, which is a pretty small little community, these are fairly ambitious for such a small little community, but they felt like that they wanted to push themselves and they wanted to, they know that the housing issue is dire there and they really needed to um, kind of put some pressure on themselves to do shoot high. And then they've come up with different strategies under each of these goals about how they're going to try to meet that goal. So they're trying to focus on what they're doing to not spread themselves out too thin, but to be ambitious, but to be really focused and targeted with what they're working on. And this is what we're suggesting with every trust because we've seen so many trusts get really overwhelmed with how in, intense the housing needs are in the community and how the resources are always really limited. And so oftentimes trusts really end up spinning their wheels because they're really overwhelmed and they're not sure where to start. We're really trying to encourage trusts to work with other boards to identify kind of a niche for the trust of what you're gonna focus on so that you can do a couple things really well, two or three things really well, instead of really struggling to do 
five or seven or eight things. And then we are encouraging trusts to, and I don't know if Amherst has anything like this yet, but to have some kind of um, guidelines, a document that puts together a variety of things where your mission statement, your goals, the strategies are, roles and responsibilities of the trust, um, priorities or the things that you're really focusing on with your funding, any kind of stipulations you have with your funding. So to be clear about what income level, as an example, that you're wanting to fund, um, perhaps some language around monitoring and reporting. Um, so your expectations when you allocate funds, an application, some selection criteria and an application form. So these are just examples of things that are in guidelines, but we're encouraging communities to do this just so that you're, you have things in one place that they're, it's easy for people to understand what you're about for people who might wanna access your funds, they understand the process and they understand your priorities. And you know what your mission is currently is it's really reminding people that you're a municipal entity and that you're really, um, you see your role at this point as helping to implement the, the goals of the community. So this is, the guidelines should be um, connecting all of that, those pieces. So it shouldn't be something that's outside of that, but it's just articulating what the, how the, the piece that the trust is working on or the pieces, what you're really focused on. And we do suggest that when you have multiple housing entities or different entities that are working on pieces of the affordable housing um, puzzle or needs, that you have conversations, that you're clarifying roles across boards, that you're having conversations about how you're gonna work together, what might overlap, and you might even have conversations around who's gonna fund what, so just going back to Wealthly, they've decided that the, the trust is going to focus on development, housing development, and that's what they're really going to fund. The housing authority is going to work on funding programs like rent assistance and uh, um, uh, uh, home ownership program. So um, they decided up front to have some conversation so that there's clarity around who's doing what. And we would suggest this for every community. So this is just from Manchester's housing production plan and they identified housing strategies on the left, some shorter term, a little bit longer term strategies and on the right, the lead board or boards to help with, um, so there isn't stepping on toes to help with some accountability. Um, having something like an exercise like this can be really helpful if you haven't done it yet or if you have done it in the past, perhaps updating it. And then we always remind communities to um, trust to be transparent. We all know that Housing development, particularly affordable housing development, can be controversial, unfortunately. Um, don't make it difficult for people to understand who you are, how you see your role, who's on the, the trust board. Um, in some communities, they have joint board appointments. Perhaps they have a CPC member on the trust board or another board represented on the trust board. And we just caution against um, having people that are on too many boards because then it's hard to get quorums. It's just hard to get participation. Your, your board really needs to be an active board. But in some communities, they've decided that that's important for communication. We suggest that you report back to whoever you identify, whatever boards you identify as the critical ones. And sometimes that means a, a joint annual meeting between different boards like the CPC or um, in town, sometimes a select board. Um, or reporting back to the town council try to do that regularly. Um, and when you do fund different initiatives, then promote them. If you use social media, use that. If you have a web page, just make sure that you that you don't make it difficult for people to learn about what you're doing and um, who's engaged in the work. So I'm gonna shift to eligible activities, but I wanna pause if there are any questions. Any other questions? I know it's a lot of information. Yeah, I have a question that I can, I think that can wait till the end, but it does have to do with um, the relationship you just talked about. Um, so often our work is very much entwined with the town's work. Um, ergo, we have Nate, who is wonderful in terms of planner, who is always supporting us. We now have Greg, who is funded both by the town and ourselves to support affordable housing. And uh, Dave is on right now. And then we have Paul, who's the manager, who's a de facto member. Um, so when you know, we talk about roles. Um, we really work very close and in tandem uh, and jointly in terms of 
um, what the town does, and the town often reports to the town council. So I think, you know, um, later on you can talk, if you can answer this, um, how have some of the towns sort of distinguished themselves uh, separately from the town and how have they used their role to actually either present to the mayor or to the town council or to the select board in terms of what they're doing or have they done it jointly with the towns themselves? Okay. Um, let me think about that a little bit. I wanna answer that. Thank you. So switching to eligible activities. So I'm particularly because you are a CPA community, I'm, I'm using this graph that the Community Preservation Coalition uses um, and because all the eligible activities, again, I'll say again, all the eligible activities under community housing with CPA are eligible for a trust. So the verbs that are used in CPA is acquire, create, preserve, and support. Uh, rehab and restore with CPA funds is only allowed if the housing was created or acquired with CPA funds. And support is the category where under CPA, it's, it's only intended for housing. So I'm going to go through different activities using these verbs just because of the relationship between the two statutes. And in some of the examples that I give, the it was really technically the CPC that funded these activities, but the everything that I am presenting are things that the trust could fund as well. So this is just an example in Barnstable where there was an existing apartment complex um, that only a portion of the housing, the units were affordable. And a nonprofit developer, POA, was able to use $500,000 of CPA funds to acquire the entire complex. And now almost all of the units are affordable in perpetuity, although a few were kept at market rate because they didn't want to displace any um, households that were not um, income qualified at the time. So one example where you could support acquiring existing housing um, to make it affordable. Um, Erica, do you want to facilitate? Should I just call on Grover or I don't know what the process is? Oh yeah, go ahead. And, um, you can go ahead and just call uh, on Grover. I think go some ahead. of us have just <laughs> openly just asked questions versus yeah. being uh, horrible so and putting <laughs> their hand up. Thank you. <laughs> Um, so my question is, can you clarify the difference between preservation and rehabilitating? Because yep. I think of those activities as one of the same. Yep. So I, I will. I will get to that. I will absolutely oh, okay. do that. Thank yeah. you. Sorry. Yep. That's okay. Nope. Um, another acquires, we have, we actually have quite a few, several affordable housing trusts where they run small scale home ownership programs where they're helping to oftentimes they're called buy down programs and they're structured a lot of different ways, but they're essentially helping a income qualified household purchase an existing unit of, you know, an, an existing home in the community. They're oftentimes like this picture in Norfolk, more, the more modest size homes. Um, but it's high subsidy per unit. Oftentimes it's several hundred thousand dollars, couple hundred thousand dollars, depending on the community. Um, I don't know of any community that adds more than two, maybe three units a year, but as the market gets tighter and tighter everywhere, it's just very expensive per unit. But it is one way to help access, help folks access homeownership. It is spreading the affordable units around the community. And then there's a, a restriction that's added. In some, in some communities, it's a, the, a, the universal deed rider that the state requires because they want the units on the subsidized housing inventory. In other communities like Leverett, not far from you, their they their program is up to 100% of the area median income, so they have their own restriction, um, and they're not on the subsidized housing inventory. So they're structured a lot of different ways, but this is um, one way that some trusts are using some of their funds. And then we have a, a lot of examples of trusts helping to support new creation, the new construction of affordable housing in Norwell. This site what had been a police station, and it was. Um, voted to be um, surplus land, and then they transferred it to the trust, and then the trust actually oversaw the, some pre-development work and writing a request for proposals, reviewing applications. They accepted one from a, a proposals, I'm sorry, from a developer, a nonprofit developer who built these 18 units of, in this case, age-restricted rental housing. And between the trust and the CPC, they put in over a million dollars into this development. In Brewster, this was some um, housing authority surplus land that MHP did some of the pre-development work, worked with the housing authority in the town on this. And then the town supported this additionally by applying for a mass works grant to help 
create a um, road access as well as a, um, connecting this site to um, sewer. And now it's 30 units of rental housing in Westport. This was some um, municipal land. This was a project that took many years. The trust was engaged in it for about 10 years. There was a municipal site. The trust helped to acquire an adjacent site that gave access to the municipal site. They did some pre-development work and released a, a request for proposals. And then the trust also fund gave some um, funds to the developer that was chosen. Uh, it's a nonprofit, the Community Builders, and it's now 50 units of rental housing. So we're seeing more and more trusts engaged in development and helping to dispose of municipal land for affordable housing. In some cases, like in Norwell, it, the land is transferred to the trust. In most cases, it's just that the trust is engaged and supportive of the process. And then there are quite a few examples of adaptive reuse. So reusing existing buildings for affordable housing. In Middleborough Shoe Shop Place, this had been a shoe factory and two nonprofits were able to redevelop it into 25 units of rental housing. There are a, quite a few examples of schools, municipal schools being reused for affordable housing. The Swampscott and Auburn are two examples of that. And you can't see it in the Swampscott photo, but in the Auburn one, you can see how the developer also added on to the, the um, historic building. They added an addition to get a few um, more units just to make it more economically viable. And then in Williamstown, this is was a um, had been a, a mill, I think it was a mill that a developer redeveloped into affordable housing. And in some of them, you can see the middle borough, they were a brand new CPA community at the time of that development. They didn't have very much local funds, so they only contributed 25,000, but it was enough for this to for them to access other resources that they needed. And then in Williamstown, the contribution was two the local contribution was 200,000. So it differs depending on the community, depending on the resources, depending on the development. So getting into um, Grover's question, what preserve means. So in the CPA statute, the definition of preserve is the protection of personal or real property from injury, harm, or destruction. It's a higher bar than rehab. So um, again, CPA funds cannot be used for rehab unless the housing was created or acquired with CPA funds. It is true that in the trust statute, that preserve is not defined, but because the trust statute, test statute came after the CPA statute, we do consider this definition, um, particularly if you have CPA funds, because the restrictions of CPA follow CPA funds to the trust. There is this memo that um, DHCD at the time, now HLC, um, put together around housing authority units because this issue of rehab is an issue with existing affordable housing when you're using CPA funds because housing authority units were not created or acquired with CPA funds. Um, when we talk about preserve, we're typically talk, talking about the um, expiring use when affordability restrictions are expiring. However, there are cases where it could be used for actual building when we're talking about the the um, kind of the umbrella, the envelope of the building. It's not um, renovating kitchens and bathrooms. It's really keeping units livable. So for this example in Gloucester, the housing authority had a roof that had been leaking and they had already had to shutter one unit and others were at risk. They were not livable because of the leaking. So they used some CPA money that they um, added with the supplement, the state modernization formula funding to replace this old roof so that they didn't lose other units. So this is preserving, it's preserving the asset. It's it's the, it's the not rehab where it's um, new flooring. It's it's really um, protecting the, the asset of the, of the unit. In most cases, we're talking about expiring use or restrictions that are set to expire. So you have a great example of Rolling Green in Amherst, where you had a, a, a large rental development. And I, I, I swapped it out to use Bedford's, but just to remind you that you have a great example. Um, 41 of the units were affordable. The, uh, the restrictions were set to expire at, your, at Rolling Green. Your community, you were concerned about this because of the, the need for affordable housing. The, the owner didn't want to extend the affordability. 
you reached out to MHP and we did some work. Um, the, you, you reached out to Beacon Communities, a large scale developer that has a lot of experience in 40B developments, in low income housing tax credits and multifamily housing. They negotiated to purchase Rolling Green and then your community, you voted to bond $1.25 million of CPA funds to go towards that so that those 41 units are now affordable in perpetuity and Beacon is now the, the owner. So you have a, your own great example of preservation of affordable housing. This is another one in Bedford, Bedford Village Apartments, 96 units of um, rental housing, affordable rental housing spread over 10, 10 buildings. Restrictions were set to expire in 2018 and POA, a nonprofit developer, negotiated to purchase them. And this community put in $3 million of CPA funds towards this development. So now these 96 units are affordable in perpetuity owned by a nonprofit whose mission is to um, create and manage affordable housing. So this is typically what we're thinking of when we talk about preservation of affordable housing. Grover, do you have any other questions with that or anything you'd like to um, talk about more with this? Well, yeah. So just to clarify what I'm hearing, the loss of use includes the loss of use of the property being affordable. In yes. the example you gave of Rolling Green. Okay, so it's not just that the building will crumble, but right. the building will no longer be affordable. Okay. Exactly. Yep. So sometimes it's called expiring use or just the affordability is set to expire. So maintaining affordability is typically what we think of with, preser with preserving affordable housing. So under support, the kinds of things that have been seen as um, possible or as allowable have been pre-development. So if there's a municipal site that you're considering for affordable housing, using some funds to do some initial pre-development work could be something that you are engaged in helping to fund. Um, you can be using CPA trust funds to help with updating housing plans and rent assistance. Someone brought up rent assistance. That's explicitly allowed in the CPA statute. And so that's something that trust can be engaged in as well. And in fact, during the pandemic, in several communities, it was actually the Affordable Housing Trust Fund that initiated an, an emergency rent assistance program. So um, any other questions at, at this point before moving on to just a few tips around working across boards? No. Okay, so um, one thing is that, you know, you're gonna be doing a housing production plan. We encourage that just to make sure that you're doing this kind of updating, this kind of work, um, not in a vacuum to make sure that it's not just a trust thing or just a planning board thing, but that multiple boards are engaged, that multiple different stakeholders are engaged in this. You wanna make sure that the, the needs that you're identifying are known widely across the community. So we would just encourage you to make sure that you have a, and Amherst is typically good about this, but did you have a, a community engagement component to any of this kind of work? And, um, and another board is the CPC, make sure that the CPC is also engaged in understanding housing needs as well. That's, that's an, an important group because of their, the funding that they have. Um, CPCs can fund housing trusts and it can just be transferred to the trust. There doesn't, the, the statute doesn't require, the CPA statute doesn't require that it be for a particular purpose. It needs to be CPA eligible purposes. Um, so we have some communities where the CPC is, just will transfer funds without needing a specific project. In other communities, the CPC really wants the trust to apply like anyone else for a specific program or project. Um, we have some communities where the, the CPC is willing to suggest an, uh, an allocation kind of automatically every year. Maybe it's the 10% that are, um, have to be housing funds. Um, maybe it's a different amount. Um, other communities, they really want the trust to apply every year. We do have a couple communities like Cambridge and Somerville that transfer a significant amount of their CPA funds every year to their housing trust. Cambridge is 80%, the maximum amount um, goes to their trust every year. They really see the trust as the community housing arm of their CPC. Somerville has been transferring about 45% of their CPA funds every year to their trust. 
Um, although a I think a developer could come to either entity, but the 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 trust is really the primary housing entity. Um, most communities, it's it's significantly less, but um, it looks different in different communities. The hope is that the the relationship is strong between your boards and that the um, your good news of the three hundred thousand dollars hopefully that continues and that you build that that trust. Again, just grant agreements. We always say you should have grant agreements between the CPC and the trust, between the trust and anyone that you fund. It's municipal land. You have, I'm sorry, municipal money. You have um, fiduciary responsibility over how these funds are used. So you just want to make sure that there's clarity in that. And we really suggest that you decide critical elements up front about how your boards work together, um, how you work together. I'm sorry, how you, oops, <clears throat> what you may need from each other. Um, one thing is if you do have CPA funds and you want to use that for any kind of administrative position, I know that you already have some staff, but um, you just want to be clear that some CPCs don't want any of their CPA funds being used for admin kind of support for the trust and others are okay with that. So it's just something that sometimes that ends up being a surprise, just be upfront with um, um, that kind of a conversation from the beginning as early as possible. And then Sh one thing- Yep. Can, can I ask a question? Good going back a couple of slides, yes. just about um, um, around. I'm just curious how other communities handle scenarios where projects might be seeking funds both from the CPA and the trust. Do, do you see that around yep. the state? Yep. So in some communities, that's fine. They're they're okay with that. In other communities, they want certain things to be funded out of the trust versus the CPC. So it really just depends on the local community. And, and frankly, some of it is kind of territorial stuff as well. So, and a little political. So it just, it looks different in every community. So some communities like I'll bring up Wellfleet again, they decided that the, um, the trust is going to do development and the housing authority is going to do programs and the CPC will just allocate funds to those entities for those purposes. And so they've really made that clear in the community. In other communities like Somerville, they transfer a big chunk of their CPA funds to the trust, but a developer could potentially go to both entities for, for funding for development. Um, so it, it, it looks different in different communities. And I, I think it is helpful to have the, those conversations just so that there's an understanding of kind of expectation. But part of why I think it's really important for trust to really narrow in on your goals also is particularly in a community like Amherst where you where from what I've been told in the past is that you have a variety of different boards, groups that are working on different pieces of the housing puzzle that you wanna have some clarity around who's getting limited funding for, for what kind of initiatives just so that you're not stepping on toes, that you're not duplicating, um, that you're being really, I think, efficient with your your people resources as well. So one thing that boards can do, and, and this is something that I think Amherst has done. Um, one thing that Connie from many years ago, training that I did with Connie and her name, her last name is escaping me, but you're, you're Connie, Amherst Connie. She brought up, um, she's involved in housing for such a long time, but she brought up this phrase of a culture of support that an Amherst had worked on creating a culture of support for housing, affordable housing. And I, I like that kind of uh, um, phrase, that kind of uh, image of that it's not a, it's not a one-off thing. It's not just one development that brings people around or that solves this, this challenge. It's really a long-term effort and it's people working collaboratively this is just one resource that a couple of groups tested messaging, housing messaging in the market to see why do certain messages, housing messages backfire. It's a super simple read. You can Google it. It's just as a resource. And they talk about things like in, in the when we talk about housing and housing needs to balance people with places and systems that we don't want to just talk about people that need housing, but also the places and the systems that make it difficult for people to access housing. So to balance that conversation to not talk about the story of them, but the story of us, that these are people who are part of our community, they are us that are struggling to access housing, connecting housing to other social issues. We know we have such, so much more data now to know that that health 
outcomes increase and educational outcomes, education outcomes improve when people have safe, affordable housing to live in. Um, we know now that where you live affects your, your outcomes, your children's outcomes. And then also just to consider the language that you use. And these are some things that you can do across boards to make sure that you're you're talking about housing similarly, that you're being, being thoughtful about what kind of messages work in Amherst. So they tested um, words, home versus housing. And what they found is that housing, people think of as more, um, unfortunately, some people think of it, uh, they think of public housing. And that's um, as critical as that housing is for a lot of people that has a negative connotation, or it sounds, um, uh, more like market-based language versus home is where they find themselves and their family. So even talking about affordable homes may be more effective than talk about housing, affordable housing. Uh, one thing that I try to be careful with in communities is that in the in the housing development world, the word project is used. It's, it's just a language that's used in the development field. But for a lot of people, that means projects, and that's really negative. And I've had communities talk about Cabrini Green in Chicago that was torn down years ago and they still have these ideas of this massive housing and that's what affordable housing is. So there could be some conversation if you haven't done this already or refreshing it of how, how do you talk about housing needs in your community and perhaps do that jointly with other boards so that you're, you're um, kind of speaking the same language. And just to kind of to wrap up a little bit, um, I just like to remind communities to really start with understanding your local infrastructure of the, the needs, but also the assets that you have. And as a trust board to work on finding your niche so that you're not duplicating work, that you're not stepping on toes, but you're really finding what's the best, what are the best roles or the best things for the trust to be focusing on given your capacity. And that you really create, suggest that you really create goals that reflect identified needs. Um, People have opinions and thoughts and stories, and those are all useful and, and helpful, but sometimes those lead to kind of the path of least resistance, investing in things that are the path of least resistance that are that are gonna be fought the least, and they're not necessarily a reflection of the greatest needs in the community. So we, we really urge you to, to um, create your goals um, reflecting identified needs in the community, and then be real about your capacity. You're a volunteer board. The needs are huge. Your capacity is limited. The resources are always limited. So try to try to find a couple things you can do really well um, instead of being spread way too thin. We have a ton of resources, online resources from an updated operations, trust operations manual. We have data town, housing toolbox, a variety of different resources. And MHP, as MHP staff, we want to be um, partners with you. We want to support your work as well. So I'm gonna, I know that was a ton, I'm gonna stop sharing. And um, I did send this presentation in PDF form to Greg and you're welcome to, to post it, to send it out. But I am happy to stay for a little bit if there are other questions or just conversation that you wanna have at this point. Well, first, let me just say thank you very, very much, Shelley, for giving us this uh, Housing 101. Um, we really felt it was very important before we start uh, focusing on our action plan that we're all on the same page of having an understanding of what we can do as a trust and what the parameters are. So thank you very much for that. Uh, so Carol has her hand up. Go ahead, Carol. Um, well, I, I know that in a lot of the things that you described and in a lot of the things that we've talked about, trusts can own property. Trusts can get the property. But uh, how does that compare to trusts doing other things and not owning the property? And the one specific question I had was I thought there was a place you were describing me. It was in Brewster where the trust acquired the property and then all these amazing things happened and there was a big development there and who owned it in the end and how did it get from the trust having acquired the property to wherever it ended up? What is the relationship between trusts owning things and, and the future of them? I'm not being very clear on my question. I don't mm -hmm. think, but. So it, it is true that the statute does allow a trust to own property. The thing that we really um, caution against is that, that that to own property that that takes managing the property, and so we, while theoretically you you could 
Um, there are a couple of trusts that thought that they would own small scale homes and rent them out, but they're not thinking, they weren't really thinking about the capital costs, the long-term costs of maintaining it. And when you have a depressed rent, you're never going to get enough to cover that. So you're just always going to have to add additional funds into it to keep it up. And a, and a trust that's volunteer-based, it, it really is not, we don't think it's the best use of your resources and your time. So in, I don't, I don't either. I just yeah, was wondering. Yeah. That's good to yeah. hear. <laughs> and and if you own it, you're a public entity. So then that means that you have procurement laws that you have to follow. So it can be expensive too. So it's in all the examples that I've that I've given. It's that the the, the town might have a land lease, so they might technically own the land, but it's the developer that owns the the development. In many cases, the land is actually the developer buys it or is transferred to the developer. So in some cases it's a land lease. In other cases, it's um, the developer ends up open owning it and then manages it over the long term. With a if you if you're using CPA funds, the CPA statute says that if you acquire a real property interest using CPA funds, then there needs to be a restriction in perpetuity for the purpose in which it was bought. So that's a given that it needs to be affordable in perpetuity with CPA funds. And a trust could decide if it's non-CPA funds that you're using, you could decide to have a shorter restriction, but if you're using municipal land, there's probably an incentive to have um, having units affordable in perpetuity. Yeah, thanks. Thank you, Carol. Gaston? Hi, I'm uh, wondering, I, looking at one of the, the brochures and the, what those 16 powers are, I guess the trust can pledge their own assets as collateral. I'm wondering if they can also pledge town assets in any case. If Are there other assets that can be pledged by a trust besides its own accounts or property? Um, so I, that's getting beyond, I think you need to consult with town council. Um, and I don't know if there are very many communities that would want non-trust resources used that way, but that's that's going beyond what I feel comfortable actually advising on. Sorry. Okay. Thank you. For, for most trusts, they most trusts never have that many resources, to be really honest, in their account at any given time. And so most it's not really, they're just not operating in the realm where um most are on a cash basis. I, I don't actually don't know any that have borrowed other than Orleans having a line of credit. And I don't know if they've actually used it. They just have it. Um, and there are communities where they've, tr they're using ARPA funds with their trusts. So, and they, so like Lynn, Lynn has more resources. They put $3 million into their, of ARPA funds into their trust. Worcester has put quite a, quite a bit of funds, um, ARPA funds into their trust. So they they have been able to work on a much bigger level. And of course, Cambridge just has so much more money because it's Cambridge. So in some cases, the trust ha does have a good chunk of money, but in, in most of our communities, the resources are fairly limited. And I don't, I don't at this point know of any trust that's actually borrowed against the resources. Can you say again what the ARPA is? I'm sorry, um, federal federal um, funds through the um, uh, the American... Good grief. Rescue. Rescue plan. Oh, okay. yeah. out of, that came yes. out of out of COVID. Yeah, yeah. So, so some still have sure, some sure, of those. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. And I think that those funds are, I think it's they have to be allocated by I think it's the end of this year. So they're they're trying to trying to um get them allocated. And there may be towns that have used um have transferred ARPA funds to their trust. I don't know of any offhand. And I think Nate wants to respond to that. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, uh, I was going to say Gaston in the bylaw, it says, you know, trust assets as collateral or to mortgage again. So it's not, you know, any town property. It's what is under trust control. Uh, I guess it would, it would have to be a side deal and the, and that could happen. You know, the, the trust can enter into contracts, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, so like the CPA committee in town often borrows against this future, um, you know, revenue, right? So there's a lot of debt service. If the trust were had a steadier stream of income, you know, it could borrow against future earnings. But, you know, like Shelley said, it's it it's it's a little risky if you don't know cash flow. And so, um, 
you know, I think there's other ways the trust can facilitate something if that's necessary. So, you know, the trust works closely with the town and we could, you know, work with a developer or other nonprofits to do, you know, to facilitate something. I would, I really wouldn't think the trust would want to have, have that kind of, you know, borrow itself to the max and then have trouble paying it or, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I, I mean, I'm thinking collect, right collateral to back other to 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 give backing um, as opposed to um, producing money. Thank you. But I think it speaks to the importance of the trust having a strong relationship with the CPC because if there is something that comes up that the trust is interested in, it could be beneficial then to you. You could potentially use CPA funds in that way, and if you have a strong relationship between the boards, then the trust could help kind of facilitate that kind of an investment, perhaps. Of CPA funds. Carol, I was this was this was something that John Hornick said once. But if the if the real estate transfer fee were to go through, so that we so the trust had kind of a regular, you wouldn't know how much it was, but after some years of of history, we would have some kind of regular revenue stream. Then you might actually be able to use that to do some big project, but you know borrow against that stream right now i wouldn't i wouldn't no you know there's nothing there's nothing you can count on really so yeah mm -hmm. so it gets it goes back to the question that i sort of had um and i think i clarified a little bit more in my own mind but i think it's part of the process we're probably going to go through in terms of you talked about our niche you know what is the, the niche that you know this trust can have and thinking about the resources we have, that includes uh, we as uh, board members who are volunteers, as well as the assets that we have. Um, I mean, I think, you know, part of our major role that we play is a catalyst role, um, keeping affordable housing uh, on the radar and on agendas for the town uh, and town council. Uh, and really uh, constantly thinking about opportunities or creating opportunities or how, you know, we talked about pipelines to get things in the pipeline, to get them moving. Um, so I think, you know, um, that's part of our role that I think, you know, we play, but I still, I think it's actually not a, and I'm sort of stream of consciousness, so excuse me for that. Um, but I think, you know, having real close relationship with the town and town council, knowing their um, you know, their housing plan is really important to know how to maximize, um, you know, where we can push um, development of either home ownership or rentals um, by working with um, the town that can actually make it happen more so than we can be it with uh, working with the developers or getting, we can write an RFP, but generally the town is the one that posts it and also pays attention to procurement. Um, and a lot of the infrastructure that now we're having help with, with Greg with, and Nate has provided a lot of help with, there's a lot of infrastructure. We're, we're not an agency. We don't have, um, you know, we don't have operational and management infrastructure. We have thinking power infrastructure. We have a lot of advocacy. Um, we have a lot of, you know, interest. So uh, for me, it sort of clarifies that, you know, we, we have a good relationship with both the town and the town council and the CPA. Um, and I think clarifying that, making it more, um, I think clear in meeting with them and talking about this might be helpful for us in the future. So I'm sorry that it's a stream of consciousness, but it really helped me clarify that um, what what I think our role is. Yeah, and and I know that I hadn't full answered your question earlier, and and I maybe won't at this point either. But um, you know, the relationship between trusts and town staff and other boards is of course different in every community. And part of what your current mission does, is it reminds people that you are a municipal board, you're a part of the community, you're not a separate silo. And so you really should see your role as helping to implement some of the town's goals or housing goals. And that's why we'll be looking at what exists, what your existing kind of goals are in the community as we're trying to identify goals for the trust. It shouldn't be outside of it, it should really be in partnership. And it should be, there should be open communication so that people, there's kind of agreement about what the trust is gonna be focusing on. I think that builds your credibility and the, the significance of your, the importance of your group, um, but then also to make it practical because you're volunteers. So, um, and I know that the needs are great and I know that we can feel really 
because people are suffering, we can feel really impatient. But don't forget to celebrate and feel good about the wins that you have had, the work that you have put in, because you've had some really good developments and your trust has been engaged in some really good developments. So don't don't forget to kind of celebrate what you have done <laughs> and as you find ways to do more. Thank you, Gaston. Uh, thank you. I'm wondering if you could kind of issue spot yellow or kind of red flags associated with affordable dwelling units or any experience you've seen in the Commonwealth with trusts getting involved in somehow promoting their uh, development? To me, some of the, the biggest concerns that I have with some trusts is that there's, uh, particularly in smaller communities, there's this interest in supporting um, really small affordable housing developments, particularly um, wanting to turn existing small developments, like say a 10 unit apartment building into affordable housing. And I am always cautioning communities because um, the owners of those developments typically don't know affordable housing. They don't understand the deed restriction. They don't understand the implications of in terms of refinancing when you have restrictions on the units. They don't understand um, income qualifying households. Like they just, the world of affordable housing is really complex. And so I tried, so I worry a lot with trusts that want to do that kind of a housing, affordable housing development, because it's actually really difficult. It's much easier to work directly with developers who know affordable housing, who have experience in affordable housing, and that's for-profit developers as well as nonprofit developers. So that would just be one of my cautions is that it seems like an easy fix or win, but it's actually really complicated because of all the laws, fair housing laws, and just the laws that govern um, deed restrictions. Um, so that would be one kind of from affordable housing and then two, um, and I think Carol was kind of getting into this, uh, we would never suggest that a trust actually be the developer or try to manage affordable housing. And we do have a trust, the Weston trust decided to be the developer to redevelop, um, small municipal buildings, one or two small municipal buildings and MHP warned against that because of just how volunteers managing that is really intense and it's very expensive because it's a municipal project then under procurement. So we would never suggest that you actually be the developer, but that you partner with developers that have experience. Does that get a little bit of what you're, what you're kind of asking? Yeah. 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 Uh, so, I mean, any, any structure that, that could work has really got to be built around the, the deed restriction issues. And, and you really want to work with people who are either, either, either it's a smaller scale developer that's hired a cons an affordable housing development consultant to help them or a developer that's already that already has experience you want you want it to be done well you, you don't want there to be any issues or mistakes because you're using public resources you don't want anyone in the community to get cynical around it like you want your projects to be done well carol um something that you said reminded me we have an we have inclusionary zoning here mm -hmm. And so there have been projects developed with inclusionary zoning requirements. And I was wondering if you have any experience, we're trying to figure out for ourselves, is this working? I mean, are there are they being used? What's happening to them? And for the same reason that you're just talking about, those people probably don't know affordable housing and requirements, but they have five units among a bunch of things that they're supposed to do as affordable housing. And I just wondered if you guys had had any experience or thoughts or anything about how how effective that actually turns out to be over time. Yeah, so in some communities, when it's really small developments, inclusionary developments, then, then that's where, and I know that some people really react, um, there's, they don't want to hear this, but with really small developments, it might make sense just to have an in lieu of payment because of that exact issue that if you have five units and only one's affordable, that the management of that can be really difficult when you get to be a bigger developments where there's more than it's might be more feasible. But in some communities, they might have, if it's rental, they might have a, they might help. They might build some capacity in the community to have a like a, a ready renter list that developers can draw from, or um, the community might help with um, if it's a home ownership unit selling it. But um I, I, there, there are, can be a lot of concerns if it's, if it's five or six units that are homeownership and only one's affordable, just the challenge of 
how that's managed long term when the when it's the unit sold. Like you just want to be thinking through having some um, perhaps having some kind of town capacity to support that to make sure that the units stay affordable, that there's monitoring going on. And so it's just why the smaller scale programs can be challenging. There can be a place for them, but it can be challenging. And so I, I do think that as you're yeah. rethinking your inclusionary zoning to maybe think through um, if you don't already have that kind of support, how can you build that if you want to continue with that kind of program? Build some support. Yeah, our, our, yeah. The, the things we have are not that small, but there's maybe like 30 units and five of them are affordable. Or, mm -hmm. I don't know the exact numbers, but it, but mm -hmm. they're, they're still, you know, a small, a minority, like what is it, 10%? I can't remember the percentage. It's a low percentage of the total number of units that are affordable and that's an interesting thought that the community should develop some kind of support to help those help those uh, those units be able to be happen the way that they should. Yeah. Or I don't know if you've heard of in the in Eastern Massachusetts, there are a few different regional housing services offices that where multiple communities pay into the regional office that then provide services like monitoring and resale of affordable huh. units. And so you um, basically, it's like you're contracting with the office. So communities based on the number of units that each community has that need to be monitored, um, then communities have a contract with the office and then they contribute a certain amount every year. But there are about three or four of these now in Eastern Mass. And that could potentially be an office, a kind of a model for several of your communities that might want to, so that you're not reinventing the wheel that one office is providing those kinds of services to multiple communities. That could be something that you consider. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Greg? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I had one, now I have a set, I have one A2 or, um, or A1 because it's, it's, riffing off of Carol here. Um, is anybody doing like buy down or anything like that of, of, of like, like inclusionary, like 80% units say, or, or, or yeah, or maybe could you point us toward like a, somebody who's doing a renter ready list, that, 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 that kind of thing? Yep. So I can, um, I can send you, so I'm going to send you information about the regional housing the Regional Housing Service Office, I always forget what the acronym is, but I'll send some information on that. I'll send some on the the ready renter list. That usually, I think that that usually is, um, I think that HLC provides kind of some guidance of their expectation about how those are run because they have to be kind of refreshed every year or two. So there's kind of a, a process. They, they got to meet the, the, the marketing requirements, mm -hmm. you know, the fair housing marketing requirements, presumably. Exactly. So yeah. I'll give you some of that information as well as the regional housing um, offices information. What was the other thing sure. that you had asked about? Um, yeah. You know, and then I, I hear you on the sort of cautionary around like partnering with, you know, mom and pop owners, you know, like, you know, of, you know, of your smaller buildings who've been, you know, sitting on it for 25 years. Um, I'm curious though, you know, is there any, you know, are there any trust or any examples of deals where, where, where trusts are involved outside of the LIHTC world, you know, like, or, 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 or do you see most of the, the, the projects really are, are kind of in, in the sort of center, you know, around place doing tax credit stuff? So we have some trusts that like in Medfield, they have part of the role of the trust is actually to support developments that include affordable housing. So like 40B kind of developments, chapter 40B developments yeah. that include affordable housing where they're not contributing any cash, but the trust is engaged in helping with the community process and um, um, advocating for the developments in front of town boards to help with the permitting process. So that that's that's a possibility that some trusts are engaged in where it's they're not contributing cash. It's not LIHTC, but it, it is contributing some affordable housing. Mm. There is the possibility um, in one community, it was a redevelopment of a historic site in Easton and the shovel, shovel shop, shovel works, whatever it was that development is called, but they wanted deeper affordability than the eight, it was 40 B under 40 B, but they wanted the 50% AMI affordability because um, under um, 40 B it's either 25% affordable at 80% of the area median income or 20% affordable at, I'm pretty sure it's 50% of AMI. And they wanted the deeper affordability. 
but financially, particularly with a historic site, like it can be, and depending on the, the market, it, the numbers may not work out. So they contributed some funds to get the deeper affordability, get mm -hmm, to get it down to 50 because they wanted deeper affordability. So that is a role that the trust could play with funding is to, with the development to um, contribute additional funds to get deeper affordability if it doesn't work on its own, even under just chapter 40B. So there are other ways that the trust could be engaged um, outside of LIHTC developments. Thank you. And it's not that a developer, a smaller scale owner of a, an apartment building couldn't, it's just that a lot of them just don't understand. And a big thing is if they needed to refinance and take out cash for capital improvements, they just, it wouldn't have the same value and they might not understand that. So it's, it just can be, I think, really challenge, a challenging way just to try to add. Just so. setting up huge, you know, messes yeah. down the line, basically. Possibly. Yeah. It'd be Thank better you. to help fund a different developer, like a, a Valley CDC or a different developer to buy it outright because they understand sure. how it works. Nate. Yeah, I mean, Greg and I mentioned this, you know, kind of scale of housing. Uh, we, you know, we talk in the office. I think it's important because, um, you know, Valley did their strategic planning, their visioning a number of years ago, and a lot of communities were there and they said they'd love to see 12 to 20 unit developments, right? That's kind of the scale that might be appropriate, not always, you know, the 50 unit building that is the tax credit program sweet spot, you know, maybe sometimes it's up to 70, whatever it is, but, um, you know, the cost per unit subsidy then is greater because it doesn't have, you know, these other subsidizing programs, but it might be the what's appropriate. So in Amherst, we have Main Street housing, um, you know, down on Main Street, it was a, you know, um, kind of a pilot uh, project between the town, Valley and the housing authority. It's 11 units. It's often used as a great example of a good massing, you know, nice design, porches, uh, townhouse style. Um, but, you know, uh, you know, it's something that I think it's a really good question. And it's something that the trust could consider, like, what is, you know, as we try to narrow our goals and our focus, you know, what is something that the trust would want to do? Because if we find something like that, it, you know, it might be hard to find a developer or to find subsidy for it, um, even if it's something that might be really kind of appropriate in certain parts of town. And so, you know, what we are seeing, you know, are, are bigger developments um, just because that's where the, how the funding gets um, brought to it. Uh, you know, so I, yeah, I, I just think it is interesting. Um, you know, we just, the trust just voted, I don't know, just last month or two months ago, an additional uh, funding for, we have the Amherst Community Land Trust, you know, that does the ground lease, mm -hmm with units and they're trying to do a home buyer program and they've had trouble given the cost of uh, property in town and they're trying to raise $250,000 to subsidize one unit of home ownership. And they have, you know, CPA dollars for it and the trust voted some money. They think they have a buyer to, you know, finalize their last unit, but you know, it's a, it's a lot of dollars per unit. Um, yeah. And so I think it's something to consider, you know, we talked about what can the trust do if it didn't have money? You know, you know, is it advocacy? Is it certain partnerships? And so, you know, I think, um, I think as we move forward, I think it's something important for the trust to consider. Okay, you know, what are, how how could we help with the town? Is it identifying other priorities? We work with council and the you know the community resources committee and the planning board. You know, there could be a few things that the trust does if it's not outlaying funds. Um, well, and to kind of speak to what you a little bit what you're saying is from a developer perspective, if a developer is working on a 60 unit development and also a 10 unit development, it's not that the 60 unit development is six times the work. It's a similar kind of work, a similar amount of work, whether it's 60 or 10 units, you just have fewer units to spread the cost over, which is why it's more expensive per unit with small development. So it's just something to keep in mind that it's it's a lot of work for a developer to do just 10 units. I don't see any more hands up. Uh, Carol? I think Carol just put her hand up. Sorry, Shelly. If you need to go, oh, just let me know. Okay. <laughs> oh, you're mute, Carol. I tried to unmute myself and I muted myself. I just had to have to throw out my thing that I frequently say in this sort of a situation, which is, one of the things we need to do is figure out better ways to do this stuff so it doesn't have to cost more to build less. It just it's it's crazy. All of the ways to do what we're trying to do 
Somewhere in the back of our heads, I know we can't fix it in 10 minutes, but somewhere in the back of all of our heads, we need to keep the idea that this is not this is nutty that it costs this much to build affordable housing. How can we somehow work on changing the whole thing so that we can get more of what we want? Thank you for listening. <laughs> so it looks like Nate has a response to that. <laughs> no, is that, it's actually a question. I mean, Shelly, I don't know if you've seen it. You know, sometimes staff talks about it. You know, a private developer could build a unit for, you know, bigger and a lot cheaper than, you know, a nonprofit developer that goes to like the tax credit program. And so have you ever seen any trust or communities that will actually just work with a private developer in a way that buys down units that are developed privately? So, you know, for instance, we could hire a local de developer, does a subdivision, builds 13 units, you know, at 300,000 a unit, which is half the cost of what it says to build an affordable unit. And so essentially we could subsidize those 13 housing units uh, at a rate that would probably be, um, you know, less per unit, just as much as a less per unit than if we were subsidizing a bigger development that gets tax credits and other things. And so have you seen any trust kind of a approach it that way? It's, it's, it's to Carol's point, it's a different, it's a totally different way. You know, you're not actually finding an affordable housing developer. You're finding a market rate developer who can develop units cheaper. And then you're subsidizing units that way. Have you seen anything like that? Um, I don't think I've seen trust engage with that. Um, you could try it. I mean, of course, LIHTC is the key funding source of affordable housing in this country. And the cost is there's a lot of overhead and admin costs to, to LIHTC. So that drives up the cost as well. Um, I I don't know of any trust that's done that. Right. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree. I feel like when we hear like, oh, it's $600,000 to build a unit, it's it's scary. I mean, that that's you know, that's what we've been hearing with some of the recent affordable housing projects. That, that's, that's a lot of money for for one unit. I mean, Cambridge, Boston, New York, it's right. very, very expensive. Yeah. Yep. Okay. I don't see any hands up, uh, including we have one attendee. I don't see any questions from our one attendee. Um, so I think we can let you go, Shelly. <laughs> um, so we're meeting in person on the 30th. 30th. Yep, and at we'll five o'clock, and the we'll be doing a little bit of prep work for that, and um, yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing you all in person, and we'll start digging into some of what you've already done and some of what you may want to focus on moving forward. We're very excited to be working with you. So just to um, sort of clarify what you just mentioned uh, for all the trust members, um, Shelly and um, Greg are working very closely with uh, Carol and me uh, uh, in terms of identifying documents to uh, read before we meet. Uh, and Greg is going to prioritize in terms of what you absolutely need to read and some background documents if you have more time to read. Um, as part of that, um, we have actually uh, looked at the strategic plan, our prior st strategic plan, and looked and um, identified what we've actually achieved uh, during that time, what's yet to achieve. So we're gonna share that with you as well, because I always think it's really important to know what we've accomplished and and what's left to accomplish if we want to include that as part of our action plan. Um, so that's all going to come, including an agenda um, to prepare all of us for the um, January 30th in-person meeting. We have yet to identify a place, more than likely it may be town hall or the bank center, so uh, easily accessible because um, that will be important. But it will be at five o'clock. And um, we, we, I want to openly acknowledge and apologize that Gaston is going to probably be calling in because um, it's going to be a challenge uh, on that day. Um, so we're also making arrangements to have a, a Zoom link for Gaston to make sure that um, he will be able to participate. But we will get the materials out early enough um, that if anybody wants to 
um, prepare comments. And if they don't think um, they'll be there or they can um, have, if they may have audio issues, we'll have that all prepared. And um, Carol and I are also, and Greg are also willing to meet with people prior and also afterwards as well. So um, we're very excited about this process and we're hoping that our last vacancy will be filled by then so we can have all of us participate and feel included and have all of our voices heard because this is going to be sort of our um, guide for the next, uh, you know, next year to three years. So I think that'll be really important. So thank you, Shelly, for working with mm -hmm. us to do that. And MHP will cover pizza and drinks so that there'll be some food for you. Oh, wow. That's great. Thank you. So I'll just, uh, we'll, and anybody, if you have any dietary uh, issues or, or needs, just let Carol and me know uh, and we'll, we'll work with Shelly on that. <laughs> Okay, well, thank you so very, very much. Thank you so much. Nice to see everyone. Nice to see you as well. Take care. It was great. Thanks. See you next time. Have a good night. You too. All right. Um, so next is, um, we actually have one person in the public, but it's uh, open for public comments. So any public comments? I don't see, thank you, George, for attending. I don't see your hand up, so I'm gonna assume there are no public comments. Okay. Um, any items not in anticipated within 48 hours? Um, I'd like to offer that, that we didn't uh, prepare Nate or um, Dave to present an update on, um, on the town. Um, but I think, uh, Nate, if you want to share what the CPA is going to recommend for the town um, in terms of the town's proposal for affordable housing, that would be useful. And also, I don't know if uh, Dave just wants to mention um, we're, how we're going to go forward with, with the VFW, um, sort of engaging the community around the e VFW design plans. Sure, yeah, I, I guess I have no, another update or two. Um, you know, speaking of inclusionary zoning units, there's uh, three down on Main Street, the Center East Commons. And so those are, you know, being marketed and, you know, all the paperwork is getting done to get those, um, the restriction, you know, recorded and on the SHI and then there's 11 units at 11 uh, East Pleasant Street, the new building uh, downtown. There's 11 affordable units there. And those are also um, under, mar you know, I think the marketing period has begun. And then those will be on the subsidized housing inventory. Uh, so that's something that's happening. And it does take a little work with staff and the developers. It's a learning curve. Um, you know, uh, before COVID, John had approached Wayfinders and asked them if they would be Kind of this regional entity to have an applicant pool and they they were interested they did say you know there'd be fees and you know we were trying to um aggregate a number of communities and it didn't it didn't work out but it's something that we talk about sometimes so that you know when these developments come along you know we could have a pool of applicants ready uh and it's not like you know a developer is um having to do something all over again they're not necessarily reinventing the wheel but it is a lot of work individually um, so th anyways those two are happening um, um, and then, uh, I was going to say just quickly wayfinders, you know, they're hoping to submit their, um, you know, there's a, kind of a two-step process for a comprehensive permit. One is, um, an initial project eligibility letter. And then that's something that says the site is generally feasible. The uh, project is generally, you know, financeable and, um, the, the, there's a 30 com 30 day comment period by the municipality. And then that goes to the subsidizing agency and they review everything and then they respond and say that, yes, you can move forward with your comprehensive permit. Anyways, the PEL phase, they're hoping to submit next month. Uh, and then we're hoping to have kind of a public meeting forum on that in uh, March. And, you know, sometimes it takes, even after the 30 day comment period, it might take the uh, state or subsidizing agency months to get back to review it all and say it can then apply to a, as a comprehensive permit. The hope is that it, they would get back and they would apply uh, in July, you know, or this summer for their comprehensive permit and the permit would be issued this fall. So anyways, that's something that will be happening, you know, spring, summer, fall. And it, it's, you know, it's, they're moving it along. So that's really, it's really nice. Um, and then Erica, to your point, the CPA, I think the town um, had reduced its ask to 150,000. And so, you know, the CPA committee, um, you know, for everyone, there's uh, it's getting really competitive, and so the town usually has 1.5 to two million dollars. There's debt service, but in the in, in the last few years, there's anywhere from you know three to five million dollars requested, and they really can't fund all of it. So the CPA committee really 
really does a, a diligent process and they try to fund as much as they can. And sometimes it means, you know, reducing budgets, but trying to fund something to make it manageable. And so, you know, the town and the trust are both receiving money. The, they support affordable housing. And, um, you know, so I think it was a really good kind of compromise and solution that they had. So the town has some funding and it was for specific properties, you know, the VFW, there's the South Amherst campus, uh, there's a town owned property on Strong Street, uh, and it could go say toward Hickory Ridge. And so, you know, that, that funding is, um, um, you know, can be applied to those, those properties and projects. And I don't know if Dave's available or not, maybe not, um, but um, we, we are, I think, starting the process of uh, bringing um, community members together to talk about the VFW design. Uh, I believe the town um, has been working to get an architect. Uh, oh, Dave, go ahead. Go see you off mute. <laughs> oh, hi. Hi, Erica. Can you see me? Yes. Yeah, I, I've been here most of the time, just had my camera off. Um, but um, no, I just want to say I really enjoyed the presentation. That was fantastic. And uh, I learned a lot. And um, yeah, some really creative things going on all over the state. Um, before I talk about the VFW, I just want to say, I mean, you know, to me, one, one of the key takeaways was, you know, for all of us to set, you know, goals. What are our realistic, achievable you know, focus goals, and we all want to do so many things, but, you know, the, the presentation was very clear, limited, you know, we all have limited time, energy, and most importantly, funding. So setting those goals and, and you know, your plan and the, uh, the, the council's plan, how does that, how do they mesh together? And what do we want to focus on in the next three to five years? Because we can't do it all. Um, we'd love to. Rental, home ownership, you name it, but um, yeah, so I, I'm looking forward to that and measurable, measurable goals, right? That's fantastic. In terms of EFW, Erica um, started to say, yeah, so we are, uh, we do intend to bring on um, an architect here uh, very shortly, um, hopefully in the next, I'm gonna say six to seven weeks um, for a, kind of a small, short, short-term contract to work with you all and staff and the community including uh, Craig's Doors and uh, any anyone who wants to participate in this in this process to kind of do some visioning around the site of the the VFW. We have completed the um, our due diligence on the old building, uh, looking at you know hazardous materials in the building that has all been assessed. We know what's in the building and we know uh, we're we're very shortly, I believe going to, uh, put out the bid for a uh, demolition of the building. Our goal is to, you know, clean that site, clear that site and make it as um, attractive to a potential developer uh, partner as possible. Um, so we're looking at a couple of public forums, meetings where we bring together, you know, folks like Valley CDC, Wayfinders, potential partners, including Craig's Doors, you all and the community to do some visioning around that site looking specifically, of course, at um, a shelter on the first floor. You know, I don't want to pre presuppose that I know what what we all will come up with, but what has been talked about is a, a shelter, uh, a service provider space on the first floor, and then uh, permanent supportive housing on a number of floors above that to be determined how, how much density we can achieve there. So that's really the goal, and to have that all done you know, um, in the next 60 days would be my goal, 45 to 60 days. So, and then we're, you know, ready to to work with you all to put out a, a formal RFP for, for the site. And so exciting. Very exciting. Thank you, Dave. We're looking forward to starting off and, and doing that with you. So very exciting to do that. Okay. Any questions about any of the updates that, that uh, Nate and Dave have provided or any comments? Okay, none, seeing none. Um, any announcements? Um, I, uh, Nate just made an announcement about the inclusionary zoning units. That's one. Uh, Nate, do you wanna, you got off mute, so I was wondering if you were uh, gonna say no, something. No, no, I'm, I'm okay. Okay. Um, I sent out um, a webinar for next. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. 
Who is that? I'm just going to say Rob's got his hand up. Oh, sorry. Thank you, Rob. Go ahead. Thank you, Carol. Yeah, I just wanted to announce um, that the amount that that you committed to Amherst Community Land Trust last time got us over the hump. Um, our buyer did make make an offer that was accepted, which is in the last few days. Uh, closing is is scheduled for February 23rd. So um, it really helped. Yahoo! Thank you so much, Rob. Yeah, that yeah, is really. wonderful news. That is really, really great news. Thank you. So Nate, um, Jim will be in touch. <laughs> yeah, I hadn't heard, so that's, that's really good news. Yeah. <laughs> Very good news. Okay. Um, so I sent out, or Nate shared, um, the webinar, Housing, Homelessness, and Health. Um, the webinar is going to be next Wednesday, the 17th. I've registered, so um, I can try to take notes if people uh, can't make it. I'm hoping that it's going to be recorded, and if it is, then I will send out the link. Often, um, for the people who participate, they often either send slides out or they send a link out um, as part of the eval. Um, so um, hopefully you will be able to make it. It's 3.30 on a Wednesday. I know many people work, uh, but if not, I will try to take some notes and then share it. Um, it looks like it's actually a three-part series, um, and I this is probably the first, uh, so hopefully I'll be able to make the other two as well. Um, but I think that'll help us uh, make the case. I think education is one of the areas that um, we all agree that we could do without funding, um, so that might help in, in better educating the community about, about why it's so important to, to have housing, um, the connection with health. Uh, and um, eliminating homelessness. Um, so any other announcements? Well, I just, Nate also sent out a thing about an in-person three-day, what is it, housing and justice or something, uh, three-day thing in Springfield somewhere coming up in April that has a registration fee. So it's both an announcement. I know Nate sent it out to all of us, but the other thing I was, Nate, if somebody goes to that and pays for it, will the town reimburse a trust member for going to something like that? Yeah, um, we could either pay for it uh, beforehand. And if you want to seek reimbursement, I would just say, you know, we have to, you have to keep invoices and registration confirmations and things, but uh, we can reimburse as well. Yeah, so I I don't know. I think that looked pretty cool. I haven't quite made up my mind if I can do it or not. But and and if somebody does want to do it, we can get reimbursed by the town. So that's my announcement. Thank you, Carol. Thank you for that reminder as well. All right, um, just possible future agenda items. I know we've had this on the agenda for a while. I actually reached out uh, to, again, Michelle and uh, now Jennifer Moyston to see if um, anybody from the um, African Heritage Reparation Assembly um, would be willing to come and speak to us about the recommendations. Um, I've heard nothing. If anybody has any clues of how to uh, get in touch personally with either of them or any of the members who might want to come talk to us. Um, I think it would be worth having this conversation also in terms of our planning and our future planning. Um, so hopefully someone will get back to me. Um, I may just visit Jennifer and check in with her uh, personally versus using emails since I've not gotten any responses. I can try and also put a bug in her ear, but I could also reach out to um, Shabazz if Thank you. Thank you, Allegra. I think that would be very helpful. All right. And upcoming meetings. So as we said before, um, January 30th will be our in-person meeting, which will be our kickoff for our, we're calling it our strategic planning. Shelly's calling it action plan because she's clear that a strategic plan is much more comprehensive. It's going to make uh, take more uh, human power than she's able to provide, but it will be our plan for our next, you know, few years ahead. Um, we are still looking for an in, uh, a location. It will be in person, and as Shelley said, we will provide refreshments. And if anybody has any um, uh, particular allergies or can't eat pizza or, or needs uh, or has gluten-free needs, just let me know. Um, to make sure that everybody has something that they can nibble on. And Gaston, we'll save you something. So when we see you, we'll, we'll bring right. it to you. 
Sounds good. <laughs> I'll bring I'll bring cookies um, and some vegan cupcakes. Um, and then our next regular meeting will be February 8th at 7 p.m. via Zoom. Um, so before we're actually uh, going to end early, but before we do, let me just ask any comments, last comments, announcements. Yeah, just the, the in-person meeting will probably likely be in the town room, in town okay. hall, uh, just because it's uh, we have the equipment so we can either video or phone in Gaston. So, you know, the other meeting rooms in the bank center would be difficult to actually have a, a conference call. We do have a conference call stations. I think we can have IT help set up. We would put tables in the middle of the room so we don't have to sit at the council seats. Um, and then it can be something where, you know, it's a nice setting and we can all hear each other. So, you know, that's probably what it'll be. Um, and we, you know, we've confirmed that it's available. So, uh, you know, I, unless, I, right, Greg, I mean, that's kind of where we're leaning. I think it. Sounds good. Let's, let's yeah, confirm it. So. And, uh, yeah. So everyone knows that that's going to be, it's going to be in the town room. Mm -hmm. And uh, if it's good for the audio, that's, that's really important. So. Okay, great. And um, as we said before, uh, Greg is going to um, send out um, the materials. Uh, we're still solidifying the agenda. Uh, and then we'll have that available way before so everyone could um, prepare for that meeting. So I, I think, go ahead, Carol. All uh, I want to do is thank you for doing this whole meeting by yourself because I messed up my back and I'm kind of sort of not... I'm all here, kind of, but I'm really grateful to Erica for having run the meeting. So thank you very much. Very simple, very easy. We're all we're all here um, as leaders. So I want to thank all of you for your commitment and for being here this evening. I think it was very insightful, and it's really um, the beginning of our process of of creating um, this action plan that I think will be so important for the next few years. So hope. Everybody stays safe, stays well, um, or recovers a speedy recovery. Um, and we'll see you on uh, January 30th. And we'll get to meet Corinne, our, our newest uh, trust uh, trustee. So have a nice evening. So I'm going to adjourn at 847, the trust meeting. Thank you. Thank you Thank very you. much. Good night. Thanks all.